All right, let's continue on this third unit of the course, focusing on applied ethics. Last week we took a look at articles that present arguments on both sides of the abortion issue. This week we'll take a look at the topic of the death penalty, starting right now with uh, Primorotz's article, Justifying Legal Punishment. In this article, Primorotz presents a number of arguments for why capital punishment is just, and then later this week we'll take a look at an article that presents arguments against capital punishment. <clears throat> One observation that I would make about uh, Primorotz's approach uh, would be to note that it's an anti-consequentialist approach. Clearly it's a, clearly it's a Kantian approach. Um, Primorotz writes that according to the retributive theory, consequences of punishment are irrelevant <clears throat> when it comes to justification. Okay, so in the second unit of the course, we talked about the Kantian um, <clears throat> anti-consequentialist moral theory, uh, as well as utilitarianism. So this week, uh, in connection with this article, we have a good example here of one of those theories that we talked about in the second unit of the course being applied. Uh, Primorotz is applying the Kantian, the, the deontological, as it's also called, uh, approach to this specific topic. As a matter of fact, in the article, he even cites Kant. Uh, he even mentions Kant uh, in, in the article. So this is a good example for us of uh, one of the normative theories that we talked about in the second unit of the course being applied to a specific um, issue. And uh, just as I said in the second unit of the course, the Kantian approach is anti-consequentialist because as we saw, Kant denies that the consequences of an act can make it right or wrong. <clears throat> uh, similarly, Primorotz is taking that approach to this particular issue. <clears throat> so it's a Kantian, a deontological, and uh, an anti-consequentialist approach. Um, according to the retributive theory, consequences of punishment are irrelevant when it comes to justification. Uh, the moral consideration is justice. So as we've seen, Kantianism gives a great weight to the concepts of justice, fairness, autonomy, respect. When it comes to the question of whether a act is just, uh, again, from the Kantian point of view, consequences are, consequences are irrelevant. In the case of um, this article, we're not talking about a, a specific act exactly. We're talking about a policy. Um, but, but here again, the, the view would be the same. Utilitarians, consequentialists take the view that a policy is morally justified if it will maximize good consequences, if it will bring, over, if it will bring about an overall balance uh, uh, the best overall balance of happiness over unhappiness, or, or at least if it will minimize painful, unhappy consequences. As a matter of fact, um, if you think back to chapter 9, that first article on utilitarianism in the Fundamentals of Ethics, <clears throat> Schaefer Landau uses this specific topic as a way of introducing uh, the utilitarian theory. Uh, and then he goes on in those chapters 9 and 10 to explain the utilitarian theory. Uh, the way that he starts off uh, explaining the theory is, is by looking at it in terms of this specific issue. So uh, flipping back to page 121 in Fundamentals for a moment, <clears throat> uh, Schaefer Landau uh, when he's introducing utilitarianism, he makes the, he sets the discussion up in this way. He says, let's briefly uh, consider the morality of capital punishment. Uh, the morality of capital punishment can illuminate the basic nature of this ethical outlook. That is to say, the ethical outlook that he's going to explain in this chapter, uh, utilitarianism. <clears throat> there are many views about the morality of the death penalty, but most of them can be sorted into two large groups. In the first, consequentialist camp, people insist that such punishment is justified only if it improves our lives. It will have to decrease crime, increase security, and expand respect for human life. 
If capital punishment is to be justified, we must show that we will be better off with it than without it. We must look to the future. And then as he goes on to say, relevant kinds of questions to the utilitarian would be what are the benefits of executing criminals? What are the drawbacks? Which policy would yield the greatest cost-benefit ratio? Okay, so those are the kinds of questions that a, a, a utilitarian would focus on. Um, as Schaefer Landau puts the point here, the utilitarian point of view would be that we must look to the future. <clears throat> I said in the second unit of the course when we were talking about the differences between consequentialism slash utilitarianism on the one hand and Kantian or deontological theories on the other hand, uh, I said that I thought this is a useful way of thinking about the difference between the two views. It's true. Consequentialists, utilitarians, they do tend to look to the future because, of course, they believe the consequences determine the rightness of the act, and, of course, the consequences are in the future. So they do tend to look to the future. Uh, Kantians, deontologists, they tend to look to the past. In light of what happened in the past, what does justice require what does justice require of us now? What moral obligations are on us now in light of what happened in the in light of what happened in the past? And so, uh, to contrast uh, the Kantian, uh, the deontological approach, Schaefer Landau writes a little bit further down. A second group asks asks uh, not about what the future will hold, but rather about what the past requires of us. Specifically, the focus is on whether certain people deserve to be killed for the crimes they have committed. On this line of thinking, even if the death penalty is extremely costly, fails to prevent crime, and perhaps uh, even increases crime, uh, he goes on to say, he goes on to say uh, we should still impose it if we can show that criminals deserve to be executed. Before we consider making people happy or reducing their misery, we must first do justice. If giving out just desserts happens to reduce crime, so much the better. But if it doesn't, we should still execute the murderers among us if they deserve it. So whether the murderer deserves it uh, is a question that has to do with the issue of justice, this notion of what someone deserves. Uh, in ethical theory, it's called desert. This concept of desert is a part of our concept of justice. And so Kantians do tend to focus on questions like that, issues connected to our concept of justice, such as the, such as the concept of desert. What does the criminal, what does the murderer deserve? That's the relevant kind of question that we should focus on from the, uh, the Kantian point of view. <clears throat> so I, I take the time to go through the some of the differences here between the two views in order to help you see more clearly where Primorats is coming from in this article. Uh, it is true, uh, utilitarians tend to be opposed to the death penalty. Uh, again, as you'll recall, they want to minimize the amount of pain and unhappiness in the world. And so when someone's been murdered and the question of the justice of the punishment uh, for that crime comes up, utilitarians ten, ten, tend to think this way. Uh, someone has already been murdered. Going forward, what would minimize pain and unhappiness? Uh, the fact that that person was murdered in the past, that can't be undone. Um, that's, that's already done. That pain um, uh, can't be undone, obviously. But going forward, what policy would minimize the amount of pain and unhappiness in the world? Well, the utilitarians tend to reason that executing the murderer will just increase, will just result in more pain and unhappiness in the world not only the pain and unhappiness associated with the murderer being executed, but most murderers do still have family and friends um, who, who don't want them executed, so all, all of that suffering as well. So utilitarians do tend to be opposed to the death penalty. They do tend to be opposed to capital punishment because they don't see that it does anything to minimize pain or unhappiness. They don't see that having that policy, they, they, they argue that having that policy does not do anything to increase the, the overall um, greatest balance of happiness over unhappiness in society. If it could be shown that the death penalty 
uh, executing murders, if it could be shown that that deters other people from committing murders, that makes other people less likely to commit murder. If it could be shown that having capital punishment deters murders, then you could make the case that having that policy does increase, uh, does maximize good consequences as a result of the murders that it prevents. But in point of fact, uh, utilitarians tend to believe that capital punishment does not do anything to deter murders. The death penalty doesn't do anything to dissuade people from committing murders in the future. Um, they would observe that many states that have the death penalty also still have murders. So they're inclined to think that having the death penalty doesn't do anything to prevent murders in the future. And that's the only way, uh, off the top of my head, that's the only way that I could see that you might justify it on utilitarian, you might justify this policy on utilitarian grounds, but utilitarians, in point of fact, they tend to believe that the death penalty doesn't do anything to deter murders in the future. And, and so they simply apply the reasoning that I went through a moment ago. Um, there was pain and unhappiness in the past associated with the, uh, associated with the murder, but that can't be undone. Going forward, what can minimize the amount of pain and suffering in the future? And here again, their view is that executing the murder will only increase the amount of pain and unhappiness in the world. So that is how utilitarians tend to view the issue. Uh, again, I'm taking the time to set up the contrast between a, a Kantian and a utilitarian view of the issue so that you understand more clearly where Primorotz is coming from. Primorotz is coming from this Kantian, clearly this Kantian, this deontological, this anti-consequentialist approach. That's clearly the approach that he's taking to the issue. Here again, Kantians tend to, as I said a moment ago, they tend to look to the past. In the case of this issue, what happened in the past? Well, in the case of this issue, someone was murdered. Okay, um, that's a terrible injustice. And in light of that fact, what are our moral obligations now? What does justice require of us now, given what happened in the past? What do we owe to the victim in terms of exacting justice? <clears throat> in terms of giving the murderer the punishment that he deserves? These are the relevant kinds of questions from the Kantian point of view. These are the kinds of questions that the Kantian focuses on. So according to the retributive theory, and um, that's um, Primorotz's term for the theory of punishment that he's defending, and what he means by that is just that, here again, punishment should... <clears throat> excuse me, punishment should give to uh, the criminal something that is proportionate to uh, what the criminal did um, to the victim of the crime. So according to the retributive theory, consequences of punishment are irrelevant when it comes to justification. The moral consideration is justice. So again, uh, Primorotz believes that consequences to do with I'm sorry, considerations to do with consequences, you know, whether having this policy will deter murders in the future, he, he doesn't care about any of that. Whether whether having this policy will uh, bring about a greater overall balance of happiness over unhappiness, whether having this policy will minimize pain and unhappiness going forward, um, Primorotz would argue all that is irrelevant. <clears throat> uh, he, he would argue that even if the consequences are bad, it's still morally required. The only relevant considerations are what justice uh, requires that we do in light of what happened to the victim. <clears throat> so whether capital punishment deters capital crimes or not, retribution, that is to say giving the criminal what he deserves, retribution is an independent moral value and justification. <clears throat> Primrat's argues, I'm paraphrasing here, it's not his exact words, but he argues that by choosing to commit the crime, the criminal assumes the risk of receiving a legal punishment. He could have avoided the punishment by not committing the crime. Therefore, a proportionate punishment cannot be unjust treatment of the criminal. 
So later this week, we'll take a look at an article that presents arguments to the effect that the death penalty is unjust. Um, but what we see in this article is that Primorotz argues capital punishment is just. Capital punishment is the punishment that is proportionate to the crime of murder. And it's just because um, in the case of a deliberate destruction of an innocent human life, uh, the criminal understood the gravity of what he was doing. Um, here again, we're talking about we're talking about murder. We're not talking about other kinds of killing in which capacity to understand um, the gravity of what he was doing uh, is maybe diminished in one way or another. We're not talking about manslaughter here or some other case like that. We're talking about murder. Um, the criminal understood the gravity of what he was doing and understood that. He was committing a crime. He was committing the worst crime, the most heinous crime, and understands that uh, he is now deserving of uh, of the most severe punishment that we have. So, by choosing to commit the crime, the criminal assumes the risk of receiving uh, legal punishment. He could have avoided the punishment by not committing the crime. Um, so, a proportionate punishment uh, cannot be unjust to treatment of the criminal. <clears throat> Capital punishment expresses our horror at what was done. So it's important from the Kantian point of view, from Primorotz's point of view, it's important that because murder is in a category of its own, uh, a uniquely terrible crime, the punishment for murder has to reflect that. Uh, the there's no, there's no other crime that is in the same category as the, the destruction of an innocent human life. And so we have to have a punishment that is not like the punishment that we would give for any other crime. Capital punishment uh, ought to, and Primoz believes it does, express our horror at what was done. The destruction of an innocent human life is the worst crime um, someone can commit. is the worst thing that somebody can do to another human being. Therefore, the punishment has to be um, unique as well. It has to be uniquely severe. If justice is to be done, that's the, that's the Kantian view. Think of it this way. Um, what would be some other kinds of crimes? Theft, maybe taking away someone's money, um, damage to property. Here again, maybe someone damaging someone's property in a way that uh, ends up harming their financial interests, right? Those are some other kinds of crimes. Those crimes are not comparable to taking someone's life. If, let's just take the example of theft, if somebody takes your money, um, restitution is always a possibility. Society can try to uh, undo, that, undo that injustice in some way or another. Force the criminal to pay restitution Something like that. But if a murderer takes someone's life, there's no way for society to undo that. There's no way for society to extend restitution to the victim of that crime. So capital punishment has to uh, express our horror at the uniquely terrible crime of destroying an innocent human life. <clears throat> Think of it this way. Um, there's a Think of a famous swindler, uh, somebody who cheated people out of millions of dollars, like uh, Bernie Madoff, for example. That's a story that was uh, in the news a lot uh, a few years back. Uh, Bernie Madoff uh, cheated people out of millions of dollars, <clears throat> a lot of money. It might have even been billions of dollars. I, I don't remember the details of the story now, but, but suffice it to say, he, he cheated people, he swindled people out of uh, a lot of money. Okay, well, Bernie Madoff... Um, received a life sentence in prison. He's in prison for the rest of his life. Okay. Somebody like Primorats looking at, at this article, I'm sorry, looking at this issue would say the alternative to the death penalty, of course, would be giving a murderer life in prison. But that amounts to saying that those two crimes are equivalent, taking somebody's money and taking someone's life. If the if the criminals in those two cases receive the same punishment, namely life in prison, then society is sending the message 
that those two crimes are morally equivalent. But Primorats would argue that's not true. Uh, murder is um, a uniquely horrific crime. And again, the proportionate punishment is one that expresses our horror uh, at that uniquely terrible crime. If we give murderers the same punishment that we give for, for people who um, steal a lot of money, um, that means we as a society are saying that, again, there's no difference between those two crimes, that it's no worse to have all your money taken away than it is to, I'm sorry, that it's no worse to have your life taken away than it is to have all of your money taken away. But just think about it for a second. Which would you rather have happen to you? Would you rather have all your money taken away or have your life taken? I don't know anyone who would rather have their life taken than have all their money taken away. You can always try to make that money back. You can always try to get that money back. Here again, society can try to compensate you, maybe force the criminal to pay restitution or something like that. But if you lose your if if your life is taken away, uh, there's nothing society can do to try to undo that injustice. So the punishment for murder, because it's a uniquely terrible crime, Primorats would argue, has to be uh, a, a punishment that is uniquely expressive of our horror, uh, our shock, uh, our outrage at what was done. Uh, again, the destruction of an innocent human life. Primorats believes that capital punishment recognizes the murderer as a rational being who chose to commit his crime. It affirms his humanity by recognizing his responsibility for his actions. <clears throat> so many of the arguments against capital, pu capital punishment <clears throat> are based on the idea that it's inhumane. Uh, Primorats or that somehow the punishment is degrading or disrespectful uh, or denying the humanity of um, the uh, murderer when we execute a murderer. <clears throat> um, Primorats would argue that in executing a murderer, we are recognizing his humanity because that way we recognize his responsibility for his actions. Uh, you will recall that in the Kantian moral philosophy, um, great emphasis is put on the importance of rationality, right? Our capacity for reason is what makes us moral beings. Our ability to reflect on different possible courses of action and reflect on our reasons for acting and, and our ability to deliberate and to choose um, the course of action that is morally justified. Well, Primorats would argue that the murderer has reason, the murderer has rationality, therefore deliberately, what, here again, we're, we're only talking about, we're only talking about the death penalty for the crime of murder. We're not talking about any kind of any other kind of killing, like self-defense or killing somebody at, on accident, maybe in a fight or something like that. None of those other kinds of killings rise to the level of murder. Some of those other kinds of killings may still be punished by the law, but they're not punished uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as the crime of murder. So we're only talking about that kind of case. Uh, Primarats is only arguing for the death penalty specifically as the punishment for the crime of murder. So in the case of murder, we're talking about deliberate, intentional behavior. And he would say capital punishment by executing the murderer, we are recognizing that as a rational being, as a, as a being with reason, he had the ability to recognize, well, he had the ability to deliberate on different possible courses of action, and he chose the course of action, which is the worst crime, and in doing that, chose uh, a course of action which makes him liable um, to the worst punishment because he committed the worst crime. As a being with rationality, a being with reason, he is the murderer is capable of understanding all of that. And so by executing murderers, we recognize the murderer as a rational being who chose to commit his crime. Primorats would say not executing a murderer is actually a way of denying his humanity because you're pretending like he didn't have the capacity to understand that he was committing the worst crime uh, 
and putting himself at risk for the worst punishment. You're denying his rationality. And as we saw in the Kantian moral philosophy, it's our rationality more than anything else that makes us uh, human and that makes us moral agents. So Primorod's defense capital punishment against this argument that somehow we're demeaning or, uh, or disrespecting um, the intrinsic dignity of, of human life, uh, Primorod's denies that. Capital punishment recognizes the murderer as a rational being who chose to commit his crime. It affirms his humanity by recognizing his responsibility for his actions. On the retributive theory of punishment, a punishment is justified if it's proportionate. The punishment must be what the offender deserves. So here again, considerations to do with the consequences. Will having this policy have good, uh, a greater balance of good over bad consequences? All of that, again, from Primorotz's point of view, is irrelevant. The, the only relevant considerations you see him discuss in this article are considerations to do with justice. And again, two concepts that are an important part of our concept of justice are the concepts of proportionality, that is to say a just, punish, a just punishment is a proportionate one, and the idea of desert, that is to say what somebody deserves. And it's a part of our concept of justice that people ought to be given what they deserve. That goes for, for any moral context, not just issues to do with crime and punishment, but in any moral context. Um, our duty is always to give people what they deserve. Capital punishment is the only punishment that's proportionate to the crime of murder. Capital punishment is what a murderer deserves. So again, it's the only crime, it's, I'm sorry, it's the only punishment that can be proportionate to the crime of murder. Nothing else, life in prison, um, here again. We give that for all kinds of other crimes, but Primrod's point is that murder is not like any other crime. Murder is uniquely terrible, and here again, the destruction of an innocent life, because it's a, a uniquely horrific crime, has to receive a punishment that is also uh, uniquely, um, uniquely harsh. To express, again, our outrage, our horror, our indignation, our shock at what was done in the destruction of an innocent human life. On Primorotz's view, that's how we affirm the dignity of human life is by being outraged uh, at the injustice of, the, of a destruction of an innocent human life and giving the most severe punishment, a uh, uniquely severe punishment, as retribution for that crime. Mm -mm. Primorotz writes that the value of human life is not commensurable with other values. Uh, consequently, there is only one truly equivalent punishment for murder, namely death simply because we have to be alive if we were to experience and realize any other value at all. There's nothing equivalent to the murderous destruction of a human life, except the destruction of the life of the murderer. So when he says the value of a human life is not commensurable with other values, you know, there are other um, values involved in, in, in punishment. We could sentence someone to prison, um, and so that's a certain... That's a punishment in terms of a certain length of time. Uh, we could sometimes, as a criminal punishment, we fine people. That's a different kind of value, taking a certain quantity of money from them, or a certain quantity of a certain amount of their wealth from them. But time served or, um, or financial penalty paid, that neither of those values is, is commensurable, is here again, um, measurable in the same terms as the value of a human life. That's why only execution, only the destruction of the life of the murderer can be proportionate to the crime of murder, uh, again from Primorotz's point of view. The value of, of a human life is not, the value of human life is not commensurable with other values. So we certainly wouldn't think that a fine is an appropriate punishment for the crime of murder, would we? And be, uh, because here again, uh, a human life is, is incomparably more valuable than any amount of money. You can't put a, you, you can't put a, uh, a price on human life. And similarly, Primorotz would argue, um, time served 
in prison, even if it's the rest of the murderer's life, is not commensurable to the value of a human life. So Primrose's view is that only the destruction of the life of the murderer can be a proportionate punishment, can be a commensurable punishment to the crime of murder. He quotes Hegel. Hegel wrote, the 19th century German philosopher Hegel wrote, that since life is the full compass of a man's existence, the punishment for murder cannot simply consist in a value, for none is great enough, but can consist only in taking away a second life. Again, the punishment for murder can't consist in something like um, the financial value of a, of a fine or uh, the amount of time served in being incarcerated. Neither of those are enough. So again, the punishment has to be um, the taking of the murderer's life. That is... Um, the only thing that is comparable in value as a punishment, that is the only thing that is comparable in the value of what was taken to the value of a, of, of a human's life. Okay, so I've taken some time to elaborate on Primorotz's view. Most of the article is not Primorotz presenting his own view, so I've taken a little bit more time to elaborate on where he's coming from uh, to help you understand where he's coming from. But most of the article is actually Primorotz replying to arguments against uh, capital punishment. So let's take a look at some of those. Uh, one argument against capital punishment that he considers would be this. Um, the right to life is a fundamental, absolute, sacred right belonging to every human being. Therefore, even the murderer's right to life ought to be respected. Well, Primrose believes uh, in the right to life. He does believe that every human being has a right to life. But he would go on to observe that no right is absolute. Um, although the right to life is fundamental, this fact does not have the consequence that killing is never justified. Uh, an absolute right to life would rule out self-defense, for example. Uh, but that does not seem a plausible position. If somebody's uh, attacking you and determined to kill you, um, the notion that you should, <clears throat> uh, um, the notion that you would not be justified in using force to stop that. Yeah, even if the use of force to stop that resulted in uh, the assailant being killed, the notion that that is not morally justified, uh, that just doesn't seem uh, to many people plausible. Um, the notion that you don't have the right to defend yourself. Um, you, would, you would simply have to, to be in the moral right, you would simply have to allow an assailant to take your life. That just does not seem believable to many people. But here again, that goes to show that the right to life, Primorats would say, that goes to show the right to life is not absolute because everyone has a right to life, and yet we just said, if you believe in self-defense, you would be within your rights to take the life of an assailant, to try to stop the assailant from killing you. So that amounts to saying that uh, the right to life is not absolute. And Primorotz's point is that no right is absolute. And a further observation that he makes is that there's reciprocity in the rights. In violating someone else's right, one loses one's own claim to be protected by that same right. So, for example, uh, if I take something of yours and then uh, you, you take something of mine, um, I would certainly not be justified in complaining that you violated my property rights, would I? Uh, because in disrespecting your property rights, I have given up my claim, I have forfeited my claim to be protected by that same right. There's reciprocity to rights. And Primorats would say the same thing about the crime of murder. Yes, he believes the right to life is fundamental. That's right. But when the murderer violates someone else's right to life, he has um, forfeited his claim. He has given up his claim to be protected by that same right in his own case. So that's what, that's what Pimrats means here in saying that rights are reciprocal. There's reciprocity to rights. You have to respect the same right in others if you, if you can justly uh, expect to be protected by that same right yourself. Um, again, if there were an absolute right to life, then pacifism would be justified. That is to say, the position that taking life is never justified. Um, <clears throat> if the right to life were absolute, then, then pacifism would be, would be believable, would be plausible. And 
Permarots allows that that is certainly a consistent position. If one wants to say that taking life is never justified, then of course one can consistently hold that position. One can hold the pacifist position. Um, but I think most people would agree with Primorats that that is not a plausible, posi plausible position. Uh, it's very hard to defend the position that taking life is never justified. If some thug is um, assaulting uh, a little old lady, you're just going to stand by and do nothing um, because you believe that taking life is never justified and you're afraid that in trying to stop the assailant you might accidentally kill him. Um, does that seem like a moral thing to do? I, I don't think many people believe that it is. So one could adopt the pacifist position and then if one wants to say that the death penalty is unjust and so is every other taking kind of taking life then that is certainly a consistent position but it doesn't strike too many people as a plausible one and again with res with this res with respect to this point of reciprocity uh, again you can claim to be protected by right only for so long as you respect that same right in others Another argument that Primorats considers is um, this, an argu uh, this argument against capital punishment. The argument would go that capital punishment is killing as punishment for killing. But the conclusion would go there's something contradictory about that. So capital punishment involves a kind of contradiction. It's contradictory. Well, as Primorats points out, by that logic there would be no punishment. Many punishments involve doing something to the offender that resembles what the offender did. Uh, for example, we give out incarceration as a punishment for kidnapping. Now, incarceration does resemble the crime of kidnapping, right? What is, what is kidnapping? It's taking someone and putting them somewhere or her somewhere and not letting, not letting her leave. That's the crime of kidnapping. What do we do when we incarcerate someone for the crime of kidnapping? Uh, we take him and put him somewhere he doesn't want to be and we don't let him leave. It's very similar, isn't it? Um, uh, if somebody uh, steals, if somebody embezzles, if somebody takes money that isn't rightfully his, uh, depending on depending on how serious the extent of the theft, we, we may give incarceration for that as well, or if it's not a significant amount of money, we may only give a fine. Now, fining someone does bear a kind of superficial resemblance to the crime in that case, doesn't it? Uh, if the if the crime is theft, taking money that isn't yours, well, or, or taking money that belongs to someone else, well, when we find someone, we're taking his money. So there's a kind of resemblance between the punishment and the crime there again. So many punishments involve doing something to the offender that resembles what the, pun what the offender did, but it doesn't follow from that fact that these are unjust punishments. There is a resemblance between incarceration and kidnapping, but I don't think anyone therefore believes that incarcerating a kidnapper is morally just as wrong as what the kidnapper did. <clears throat> Another argument that Primorats considers is this. Uh, any two human lives are different in many respects, therefore capital punishment will rarely be proportionate. So somebody might argue, for example, that the murderer was a young man and the victim of the murder was an old man. Maybe the victim of the murder was 90 years old and he wasn't going to live much longer anyway. Um, and so not that much value was taken away from him. But the murderer was a young man and he still has his whole life in front of him. By executing him, we would be taking much more away from him than, we than was taken away from the victim when he was murdered. That kind of case might lead someone to make this claim that capital punishment is rarely ever going to be proportionate. Well, Primorats's reply to that is that, of course, any two lives, any two human lives are going to be different in lots of ways. But this does not entail that they are not equally valuable. Uh, the assumption that all lives are equally valuable is the basis for our fundamental legal principle, namely equality before the law. We do not see it as a legitimate function of government to decide which life is more valuable than another life. Let's just go back to the example that I gave, or let's consider this example. Suppose one victim of a murder is 90 years old and the other victim of a murder is uh, a young man. We would not see it as a legitimate for, gov for the state, for the law, to say, well, um, the 90-year-old man wasn't going to live much longer anyway, so the punishment for that crime should not be um, as severe as the punishment for the murder of a young man. 
we would not see that uh, as a legitimate thing for government, for the state, for the law to do. Um, we operate in our legal tradition, we do operate, as Primrod says, on the assumption that all lives are equally valuable, and they have to be viewed that way in the eyes of the law. So Primrod finds this not to be a persuasive argument either. Uh, another argument against capital punishment that he considers would be this. You know, in the case of any other punishment, an injustice can be redressed. But if an innocent person is executed, then there's no way to redress the injustice. There's no way to undo that because now the person uh, is, is dead. So therefore, capital punishment ought to be abolished. Well, Primrose, one point that Primrose makes about this argument would be that, you know, this argument wouldn't show that capital punishment is never justified, since in some cases guilt is not in doubt. Uh, there are some cases where um, the guilt of the murderer is not in doubt. He's on videotape doing it. A number of people saw him do it. Um, he wrote a manifesto saying he was going to do it. Um, his guilt is not in doubt. So this argument wouldn't work for cases in which the guilt of the murderer is, is not in doubt. Um, but even further than that, Primrotz observes that if we never execute anyone to prevent the rare injustice of an innocent person being executed, we would be allowing a very extensive injustice, uh, namely murderers never getting what they deserve. So, of course, Primorats agrees that if an innocent person were executed, that would be a terrible injustice. But he says he believes that such a case is rare, and if we were to abolish the death penalty to avoid that rare injustice, we would have a much more extensive uh, injustice on our hands. Namely, no murderer would ever get the punishment that he deserved. And Primrose uh, argues that that trade-off is just not worth it. Another argument that he considers uh, is a common one. You, you do see this one a lot. Um, somebody might argue that the way capital punishment is applied is discriminatory. That is to say, the claim would be that poor people are more likely to get it, uh, minorities are more likely to get it. That's what is meant here in saying that the way it's applied is discriminatory. And then somebody might conclude, therefore, capital punishment should be abolished. Well, <clears throat> Primorats, uh, a number of ethicists have found this not to be a valid argument. Uh, with the way that Burton lies or another uh, ethicist put the point was to say that this is not an argument against the death penalty or against any other form of punishment. It's an argument against the unjust and inequitable distribution of penalties. The maldistribution of penalties is no argument against any particular form of penalty. That is to say, if there is a discrimination in the way that this penalty is applied, that is an injustice. That's right. And we as a society have to address that injustice. But an injustice in the way that a punishment is applied and does not show that the form of punishment itself is unjust. Here again, we wouldn't say that about any other form of punishment. So Primorats, lies, or other ethicists, they find this argument not to be valid. Uh, a similar defense of capital punishment against this argument has been made by Ernest uh, Vandenhoog. Uh, the way that Vandenhoog put the point it was to say that the only relevant question is this, does the person to be executed deserve the punishment? Whether or not others who deserve the same punishment have avoided execution is irrelevant. If they have, the guilt of the executed convicts would not be diminished, nor would their punishments be less deserved. Discriminatory distribution would neither make the penalty unjust nor cause anyone to be unjustly punished. So think of it this way. If X and Y both deserve a punishment and X gets it but Y avoids it, it doesn't follow that X was treated unjustly although it is an injustice that Y didn't give what he deserved. So when you look at the logic of the argument this way, it's not hard to see that we wouldn't apply this reasoning to any other penalty, would we? Let's say um, you and I both deserve a speeding ticket because you and I were both speeding. And let's suppose I get it, but you avoid it. Well, from the fact that you got away with speeding, it doesn't follow that I was treated unjustly by getting a ticket. It is an injustice that you got away with it, but that does not show that I did that I got a penalty that I did not deserve. 
I got the penalty, the punishment that I deserved. And I was not treated unjustly because I got the punishment that I deserved. So Van and Hogg would apply this same analysis to this argument that, look, capital punishment is applied in, applied in a discriminatory way, therefore it's unjust not to be abolished. Um, even if that is true, Van and Hogg would argue, it doesn't follow that the death penalty is an unjust form of punishment. Again, if both X and, if X and Y both deserve a punishment and X gets it but Y avoids it, it doesn't follow that X was treated unjustly. So long as X got the punishment that X deserved, X was treated justly. The fact that somebody else got away with it does not show that the person who was punished was treated unjustly. Um, that would be Primorantz's argument as well.